Hello, and welcome back to Medical Compliance with Clarissa. I'm Clarissa Benfield, our Global Director and Business Line Leader for our Medical and Laboratory Business at Intertech. And today, I could not be more thrilled to welcome the ultimate medical content creator, man about town himself, Tom Salemi. Tom, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, super excited to talk to you. So as I always like to do when we get started, would love to hear just a little bit about you, your history and background, and then kind of what you're doing in the medical space right now. Sure. So uh, I'm I trained as a journalist, if you can get that kind of training, I got my journalism degree <laughs> from BU, went into newspapers for five or six years, maybe six or seven years, and kind of... Uh, the writing was on the wall even in the late 90s, and uh, I wanted to specialize. And I was lucky enough to to find a job at a medtech newsletter, actually a healthcare newsletter, and just kind of fell in love with medtech and have been covering that with a smattering of biotech and some digital health here and there, but mostly medtech for uh, since since uh, for 20-something years. Uh, stopped writing about 10 years ago because I wanted to do conferences and uh Got the podcasting bug then. I started a medtech podcast, an ophthalmology podcast, a digital health podcast, and now I'm at Device Talks where I get to do a lot of cool podcasts with a lot of great medical device companies and also put on some conferences. So it's a it's a pretty sweet deal for me. Yeah, absolutely. You got a lot of good podcasts. As you said, you talked to some really interesting people. You guys host great events at Device Talks. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about some of the podcasts that you guys are doing currently with Device Talks and then some of these events that you've had. I know you've had a few recently and have a couple coming mm -hmm. up. Yeah, no. So the podcast we started uh, when I joined Device Talks in, in 2019, it was strictly to do conferences. I was going to do a podcast if there was some time to do it uh, when COVID hit. Uh, we obviously weren't doing our conferences, so we we had to find something for me to do. So I launched the podcast network, uh, which has been great. So we've done podcasts with Medtronic and Stryker and Intuitive and Abbott and Boston Scientific. And um, uh, well, I'm trying to think if I got, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're, we're rolling. Uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, on the West Coast now recording uh, some uh, podcast series with Edwards. Uh, we're working with some others as well. Uh, we've also started launching some non-company uh, focused podcasts uh, on ortho. Uh, we're doing that with Zimmer Biomet, and uh, we're rolling something out with Sarah Novus uh, in Neuro pretty soon. And uh, we also, but I'll just finish the list. Uh, we have a MedTech AI podcast uh, hosted by Kayleen Brown, our managing editor, who we added on last year. And uh, we also have our um, it's a, our, our, been, our Women in MedTech podcast, which we've started it with the uh, affiliation of MedTech Women. We're, we're shifting to focus a bit, uh, but more the name than the focus. So we're, we're definitely trying to get the podcasts out that are talking as much about the people in MedTech as, as much as the companies in MedTech. So that's what we're doing on the podcast side. I could keep rambling on about conferences, but I could let you ask a question if you'd like. <laughs> no, 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 of course. And I think, you know, you made a you made a really interesting point. And I think, you know, as everyone in the medical field and the medical industry, right, we're really lucky, you know, COVID brought a lot of things, but mm -hmm. now just the accessibility of information, right, via all of these types of podcasts and online information and things that maybe people had to travel to conferences or events to get before, or you didn't have easy accessibility to some of these very high level people within an organization or to learn from others within the industry. Like, although there were many terrible things about the pandemic, Absolutely. you know, there are some good things from a industry perspective that came out of this, just in terms of being able to create that flow of information. Yeah, no, I, I actually am smiling a bit because uh, I listened, we, we hit our fourth anniversary for device talks weekly uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, for, we, we, I wasn't able to run an episode I was going to run. So I'm like, oh, I'll just rerun the first episode. So I listened to it. And uh, it's funny, Chris, Chris we, we started the, the podcast, Chris Newmarker, the uh, executive editor at Mass Device, started talking about toilet paper. Like, did you get your toilet paper? <laughs> and that was like, well, that was a blow from the blast from the past. Yeah. And then we started talking about, well, you know, this is crazy. Like, are people not going to go to, not going to go to scientific conferences? Are we supposed to you're supposed to talk to people digitally online all the time. I mean, this is what's going to happen. We had all these kind of head scratchers and things in describing the world that we currently live in. Uh, and I'd kind of, I forgot, but not forgot how really drastic a change it was for someone not to fly, you know, across country for a uh, one meeting and then fly <laughs> back or, you know, and I'm sure you know that better than I yeah. do that people now just do zoom calls and they say, you know what, you don't have to do this. Or you don't have to do that. So it, it, it's a sneaky different world than it was uh, even just four years ago. Yeah. And I think too, even we see from, you know, people like the FDA, right. Making all of their information mm -hmm. so much more digital and accessible and having 
virtual conferences and virtual meetings, right? We see this move towards it, which I think has been so impactful in terms of spreading information and communication faster than before. So it's been it's been exciting. Does does that allow for uh, kind of more continuous conversation, an ongoing conversation between companies and the FDA as opposed to like having a red circle date where I'm going down mm-hmm. to Washington and talking to a bunch of regulators? Yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, right, you see like even coming up in just a couple of weeks, they're doing another open public forum on the ASCA program, right? So they're doing that on April 17th. Same thing. It's open to everybody. It's like register at this link. They want people to ask questions. They want people to come in. So that makes it really, you know, a little less intimidating, I think, to your point than having Mm -hmm. to have something so formal, right? That you can join a public forum. Everyone is there to ask questions, find out more. Um, So I think that, you know, seeing that makes it, makes a little bit more, you know, kind of ease of mind for people when they're trying to ask their questions or maybe confused about things. That's great. That's great. Absolutely. I know. So as I said, you're, you're the man about town. You still go to a lot of conferences, maybe not as many as we were going to kind of before pre pandemic, but you talk to a lot of people. What are some of the things from your perspective that you're seeing in the med device industry, some of the biggest trends that we're seeing or things that are of the biggest maybe interest to you as you're going around talking to people from different companies, people who are participating in industry? Yeah, I mean, the number one, I think, for me at this point, and it's not no surprise, I think it would be surgical robotics. I think uh, just over the past four months, I wrote an article for medical design and outsourcing, uh, and I concluded it with just, you know, if, if you asked me in January if if Intuitive was going to roll out a new Da Vinci, you know, if we were going to launch a robot, into, a surgical robot into space, like if uh, if Carl Storrs was going to be making an offer on a on a surgical, I would have I would have bet maybe one of those things, not all three of those yeah. things. Um, and I don't know which one I would have bet on, but, uh, it's been, it's been crazy. And it, it, for me, at least I think it's been building, but 2024 seems like a real pivotal year where we're going to look back and say, oh, that's when surgical robotics really, really took, uh, or really formed the deep roots that it needed to, to, uh, become what it is. And, um, I mean, just looking ahead now with the, uh, uh, with the Carl stores offer to a census, if that goes through, you know, people are already kind of playing the what ifs, you know, what is Stryker going to do? You know, how, if, yeah. I, I talked to Spencer Styles for our Stryker podcast, which is going to go out shortly as uh, shortly after we're recording this. And I asked him at the end about if you're moving into soft tissue and he was like, look, like we're a really good robotics company. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we're aware of a lot of cool companies out there and I'll pretty much leave it at that. So not yeah. a yes, not a no, but I think, um, you know, I would have expected a harder no from a Stryker you know, we'll stick to our nitty kind of stuff yeah. uh, a couple of years ago, but it's the the world is changing. So surgical robotics is certainly one uh, beyond the m and I think just the consoles, as you know, getting smaller, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's definitely more uh, broadly accepted. And uh, I'm talking with a company, uh, Zavato, that was on the podcast last week about a, a digital infrastructure they're building for remote surgical robotics. And that's something I hadn't really thought of, but if you've got someone you know, I feel like we're we've been at the age where people are developing all these cool, you know, cars, mm-hmm. uh, but we're all still driving on dirt roads. And if you have a company <laughs> come along and say, "Look, here's a highway, use yeah. that instead," then that's just going to make things go that much faster. So, I kind of feel like we're we're there with surgical robotics. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, again, to your point, if you look at where we were a few years ago versus where we are now, and just this overall evolution that we've seen in healthcare. You had this slowdown during the pandemic. We've had a few years now that kind of people have been adjusting. And now we just see this incredible innovation, incredible development, incredible investments, right? All of these things that were kind of slow, right? Slowly coming back. And now it's just 2024 definitely, I think, will be such a pivotal year in terms of everything that we're seeing in the medical devices market with robotics, with digital health, with advanced implants that we're seeing uh, with AI integration development, you know, moving in a, a more sophisticated manner, right? I think when we look back, we'll see, okay, we're finally actually out of those pandemic years and really moving forward full throttle with all of this development and all of this innovation. Yeah. And to your point about the FDA, I mean, there, we mentioned the Da Vinci approval, uh, well, um, virtual incision got its approval for the mirror. Uh, I saw another system, MMI just got approval for its micro surgical robotics. So, uh, the, M- the FDA is really beginning to process uh, these things and process them quickly. I mean, Da Vinci um, Intuitive filed what three months ago or something like that. Mm-hmm. They got approval wrapped up pretty quickly. So, again, it seems like uh, it seems like the stars are aligning for for surgical robotics. 
Well, yeah, and I think it's definitely interesting, too, to see, of course, medical device manufacturers during this time with still lingering questions about the MDR, just really heavily pursuing the U.S. market and wanting to move forward so much faster there and saying, okay, yes, we want to go to Europe. Yes, we want to make sure we meet with the MDR approval process, but putting that on the back burner or moving that to a later date and really just moving moving ahead in in a quick pace, right, with the U.S. and the FDA and then circling back to to the MDR and going to Europe at a later date. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So robotics, right, that's a big trend. You mentioned AI and digital health. Are there other things that you're seeing, you know, in those spaces when you're talking to people, kind of this movement toward uh, more consumer type healthcare products or more remote patient type monitoring or things like that? Yeah. So, I mean, AI is always, you know, it's an interesting one. It's something we, we talk about. It's better than asking COVID questions, which we had to do a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you know, I think I, I, it's not something I completely grasp, so I don't want to put myself forth as an expert. But, I, you know, I think we need I think we need to be careful of the, you know, AI inside sort of claim by some companies where it's it's, mm-hmm. it's good AI, but it's not great AI. But certainly AI is going to AI is going to be playing a role. We'll have a panel at Device Talks Boston uh, where we'll have uh, AI folks from Medtronic and Boston Scientific and Sanofi actually uh, on a panel and a startup called Thermosense are talking about how AI is being incorporated into their therapeutics or or, or their, uh, their their imaging systems. But, you know, certainly AI has already played a role in, in diagnostics. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it factors more into uh, surgical robotics, just to circle back there with all the data that's generated there. Uh, in healthcare in general, I mean, I guess I could see the real application for AI being just helping doctors uh, understand all the data that we're trying to throw at them. Like, look, we have a sensor. We put a sensor in. There's a sensor in your toenail. You can count your patient steps. And it's like, all right, but how are they going to look at that? How are they yeah. going to understand that? So as AI builds more and more uh, functionality, you know, that's going to be, I think, a huge boost for for these devices as devices, as products, but also I hope for patients, because I do think data is essential and important. I know it helps me every day to kind of measure what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, AI will be huge. Digital health, I always, I don't know. <laughs> it's 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 there. I mean, it's, it's I don't know what it means anymore, to be honest with you. It seems like yeah. we've reached like well, onla- online banking stage, right? Like everything's online. Like there's no more. Well, it's so, it's so funny that you say that, right? Because even the phrase AI and digital health, both of them, right? They've become so all encompassing. And it's like, how do you really narrowly define that? Like, what does that mean? Is it literally just a product that has an application or a platform or yeah. is it could it be anything as you say right everything's online so is all health digital health right like what exactly does that does that mean and how do you differentiate it right so it's so interesting too that you bring up the doctors and the data when i was at uh, ces this year i went to the digital health conference and there was a mm-hmm. couple of sessions on ai and you know for years they've been talking about all of the like very cool very advanced things that they're going to be able to do with ai but now you can see they're actually moving into, okay, what is the practical application that's actually going to make doctors and clinicians' lives easier? And it's all of this like, oh, you're going to have an AI assistant that will listen to your uh, consultation with the doctor. It will record all the data. It will summarize the data and it will spit it back out. Or, oh, you'll have uh, AI platforms that will help nurses you know, when they're collecting data or doctors to summarize data, right? So instead of all of these like very far out there ideas about what AI could do, it's like, how do you find things that are going to make the lives of the doctors and the clinicians easier, more effective, so they're not spending two or four hours, you know, writing information down, deciphering their notes, going through that, and then trying to make a diagnosis or a treatment plan. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's not right that we we require doctors to do that, and it's not smart for us because we're we're losing uh, the very best because they're burnt out. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Get yeah. burnt out on all the data. Get burnt out on all the administrative work, and then less time with patients. Right? Less. You know, there's just so many adverse effects to that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, those those are critical areas. I'm I'm intrigued by. Um, I'm actually talking with Edwards right now for as I mentioned for their podcast about. You know, their move to really focus on structural heart and focus on value, valvular versus non-valvular devices are actually focusing on them both, giving a tighter emphasis on that. I think that's an exciting, uh, exciting area. Um, interested and anxious or eager, rather, to talk to Beth McCombs from uh, Beckton Dickinson. Uh, it's just been a, a company that I never paid attention to very much. Uh, just kind of started as a, you know, a syringe company. And but uh as it was pointed out to me, you know, their footprint, and you know better than I do, that you know, their footprint in healthcare is 
unmatched. I mean, they're just yeah. everywhere. And yeah, they're, 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 they expand the gamut, especially in the IVD space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, uh, you know, as they're building out their surgical, their surgical uh, surgery tools, uh, uh, business and as they're developing their own digital connected uh, connected health uh, functionality, it's going to be interesting to see how that company sort of takes advantage of its its reach and really uh, mm -hmm. brings brings a lot of interesting tech in there. So I'm going to talk to Beth McCombs about that at our opening keynote. Uh, so excited about that as well. I just it's going to be interesting to see where they are in five years from now. We're going to be yeah. having this conversation, being like, "Geez, remember when?" Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's it's so true because you look at, you know, all of the top 10 players, right, have been pretty diverse for quite a while, right, with the different areas in which they operate. But now even more so, right, the diversification of these manufacturers, you can't put any of them into a box. It's not just device. It's not just med device. It's IVD. It's uh, all the support lab equipment. It's all those disposables. Like you say, it's all the syringes. It's all the other disposable type products, right? You know, we see these big companies acquiring smaller technologies, right? So we're definitely, I think, going to see a, a different landscape, as you say, over the next five years, I'm sure. Yep, for sure. Baxter, we'll have Baxter talking at Device Talks Boston and same thing. They wanted to talk on what they're doing in the connected health front, which isn't, isn't something I wouldn't necessarily assign to them before. So uh, yeah. the, the, the world is changing. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about your event that's coming up before we end today. So we'll have Device Talks Boston May 1st and 2nd. I don't know if people can see it, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, make sure you show, show your background there. <laughs> That's right. Oh, wrong way. There we go. Uh, at the Boston Convention Exhibition Center. So Device Talks, uh, it's really, we're not sort of, we do have an investment component to it. We work with MedTech Innovator. We're building out a, an innovation forum this year, giving a MedTech Innovator our, our large keynote room to kind of run a massive uh, uh, MedTech Innovator Palooza in there. And they're doing a great job with that. But our bread and butter is really uh, engineering, product development, manufacturing, regulatory, all the all the stuff that I didn't really quite appreciate when I was covering medtech early on. When I just covered, <laughs> I covered financings, I covered startups and VCs, and I'm like, oh great, that company raised ten million dollars. You know, I never really giving a thought like, what are they going to do with that money and how yeah. they actually build a device. So that's been a great experience and education for me to, to learn about all the great uh, firms out there, the machine companies, the product design shops that really make MedTech go. So we'll have a lot of those folks on our show floor, but in, in, the, in the rooms upstairs, we'll be focusing on uh, engineering product development, bringing products to market. Uh, we'll talk about sustainability. We'll talk, uh, we'll have a presentation by Stryker on additive manufacturing. Uh, we'll have um, conversations about sterilization, which is just, not a problem that's going to go away. So we really do try to, it's just, I mean, it's like, what are we doing here? So, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's just this massive thing that this tidal wave that's coming at us that we need to deal with. So, uh, so device talks really is for folks who are in the med tech making business, who really are, are either in the design phase and manufacturing phase, the regulatory phase, or the commercialization stage, getting products into the hands of the physicians and or patients uh, customers, I guess I'll say. So yeah. that's, that's where we're, where we aim to, that's who we aim to please and get at, uh, the Boston convention exhibition center. We'll have a presentation, um, by, uh, Medtronic, uh, closing keynote with our robotics summit and expo, uh, that'll be, uh, focused on Hugo and its ability. We're hoping to have a live demo with folks in London, oh, wow. off Hugo's capabilities. So we want to show off some cool tech as well. We'll have intuitive the day before giving a, an update on, on DaVinci five. So, uh, it's a great day. Uh, we had 1200 last year. We're going to top that for sure this year. Um, and, um, seeing a lot of little, cocktail parties that I didn't know were happening kind of forming <laughs> around it. Like, wait a minute. Like, yeah. No, fun things are happening too. Yeah. Fun things are happening too. I want to, so I'll definitely try yeah. to hit those as well. Um, so it's, it's, I'm a Boston guy as I, as I say ad nauseum. So it's a real treat for me to be able to, to build a, a major med tech Boston uh, event and um, combines two of my loves. Uh, we tried to get the Red Sox involved in this one, but they had a day <laughs> game going on, not a, not a night game. We we're hoping to have a, a networking reception over there. But uh, yeah, so Device Talks, uh, May 1st and 2nd at the uh, Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Yeah, it'll be a super fun event. You guys always put on great events. And as you said, really interesting speakers, great topics. And of course, this isn't the only event that you guys host during the year, right? You have other ones coming up as well. Yeah, we'll have Device Talks West, which is happening October 16th and 17th. And uh, we are still uh, going to get back into Device Talks Minnesota. We had that 2019 COVID. Um, we, we 
focused on on bringing back the two and getting them to where they needed to be before bringing on the third. And, and Minnesota is a great, great, great medtech town. Uh, we yeah. need to be there, but there are a lot of conferences there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we're trying to make sure we don't step on anybody's toes and find the right spot for us. So um, so that's where we're at for now. We're we're continuing to roll out our virtual series device talks Tuesdays, which you were on recently. Yeah. Uh, started that again, May, 2020 thinking, all right, we'll do this until we get back to in-person people still, still love them. So we'll still yeah. keep doing them and uh, building the virtual map model out a bit more with some multi-day events. We had one in surgical robotics this year uh, in, in March and we'll do a connected health one in September and then we'll do more of them next year. So uh, there's so much great, cool stuff to talk about. We can't, uh, yeah, it's just finding the time to in the resources to do it all. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Very yeah. much so. So tell people too where they can find the podcast. As you said, it was super fun for us to be on Device Talk Tuesday uh, recently. So tell everybody how they can access that and find that. Of course, yeah. No, everything is kind of is housed at devicetalks.com. That's all one word, devicetalks.com. Uh, once there, you can find the Device Talks Tuesdays, uh, which are you can register for future ones or you can watch Clarissa and an on-demand <laughs> one as well as our other sponsors uh, all of our podcasts are listed there as well and links to our uh, event pages for device talks Boston and device talks West so everything is at device talks.com and if you're a podcast person you can also s- subscribe to device talks on any major podcast player yeah tons of good information coming out of those well Tom thank you so much for joining us today it was super fun to talk to you about everything that we see going on in the medical industry I'm sure the next time we do this we will have lots more to talk about lots more exciting things that are happening and looking forward to your great upcoming event in May great thank you it was a pleasure to be here so nice to be on the other side of the the microphone (laughs) yeah (laughs) absolutely thanks so much